uh, B dive department. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mark to the stage to talk to us more about the topic. Thank you very much. Well, the topic worked because you all showed up. That's good. Um, can you hear me in the back? Yes. Does my parents think we might because I don't like to use them. Um, <laughs> I'd rather roam around, so that makes it easier. Now, if you're expecting me to go and tell you how to use SAS or SPSS or analytical programs today, I'm not going to do that. I'm a user of analysis. I'm a business user, so I know how to create value from it and how to explain it to other people who don't put me in front of the PC, and if some of the charts look pretty bad, that will prove to you that I'm not very good with the PC. So that's the background that you already heard. I'm at Sync House, by the way, let's, the phone should ring, but if you want to do SMS, that's fine, because that's revenue for us. So go ahead. <laughs> so 10 things I wish I told you. Let's go through this quickly, and then I'm going to go through them. I'm happy to take questions throughout, um, and to even have discussion and debate. So we'll talk about being modest, business significance instead of statistical significance, uh, porpoising, correlation is not causality, closing the loop, behaviors being best, three ways to identify segments, learning to do, focusing on outputs, and communicating clearly. I'm going to go through all these and I'll come back. But the first thing I start with is being modest. So one of the problems when you do analysis is more often than not you're wrong than right. So I just thought I'd start off by reminding you need to be modest because you may be wrong when you do your analysis. So just to start with a little humor, that people will never trade in their horses for cars, right? That's what someone said in 1902. Telephone has too many shortcomings to be a means of communication. So that's a good thing it didn't come true. Um, that's from Western Union, which went out of business because they didn't believe that the telephone had a future. We don't like guitar music. That's Decca Records, who rejected the highest selling group of all time, the Beatles. Something more relevant to us is the world market for five computers. And anybody know who said that? Chair of IBM. There's what, probably 50 computers sitting in the room. 640K is enough for anybody. Anybody have only 640K on your computer now? Bill Gates said that. And as I said, do you have a little humility? There'll be less than one million cell phones. McKinsey. Where used to work, right? So one is just be careful of what you say with your analysis and be a little wise. First, more serious thing. I like to talk about business significance and it being a lot more important than statistical significance. And I find that statistical significance is often misunderstood in analysis, and business significance isn't applied. So what do I mean? Well, statistical significance, we all know, right? If you repeat an analysis and something is different, how likely is it to continue to be different? Business significance is different. It's I have a decision to make. If I repeat the analysis, will I get to the same answer? Or will I change my answer? Because when you're talking to a business user, the key in analysis is, what decision do I have to make? And are you going to help me make that decision or are you going to get in the way? So a couple things to think about when you think about business significance in your analysis. The first is my patron saint. Right? Not Tom Cruise, but Jerry Maguire. Anybody know Jerry Maguire's famous quote? I can't hear you. So you didn't watch the movie, right? You have to shout it, like show me the money. And often when I do training on this, I make people shout it. So first is business significance is show me the money. Talk about how I'm gonna make more money. Now if you're working with the public sector, it'll be slightly different, but in the for-profit world, it's show me the money. What does that mean? There's only four ways to show the money. And this is where you have to sit there and say, am I linking my analysis in four ways? So that's a supply and demand curve up there. So you probably remember that from economics. I could spend half an hour just talking about this, I won't. But it's you either increase market share, you capture surplus, you grow demand, or you reduce your costs. So when someone says, 
I'm doing this analysis. You say, well, how am I going to show you the money? And you ask them, am I going to grow demand? Am I going to cut costs? Am I going to build share? You might do more than one of them. But if you're doing an analysis in a business context, and you can't link it back to one of these four, then you're not talking to a senior management concern. Because the senior manager says, show me the money. And this is the way you show them the money. So that's the first part. Sort of focus on where the money is. Second is, think about where the risk is. So I like to use this simple framework. This is the value at risk, not the total value, but the value at risk. And this is the uncertainty. And what you want to do when you do your analysis is be up there in the top corner. You want to be talking to someone, and they're going to say, I don't know the answer, and the answer matters. I have high uncertainty, I don't know the answer, and it matters, right? There's high value at risk. If someone says, I pretty much know the answer and it really doesn't matter, don't do the analysis. Use your judgment. It doesn't matter. Person, you know what the answer is, and probably if you give them a different answer, they're still going to make the same decision. Remember, we're coming back to changing a decision. So if someone says, I know what the answer is, and it really doesn't matter, because if I make a mistake, I can recover quickly, make a judgment call. But what you find is we don't do enough work in that top corner. And by the way, it's not going from, I don't know the answer, to I have the absolute answer. It's just reducing the uncertainty. The role of analysis is to reduce the uncertainty, and reduce it for things that matter, and don't do a lot of work in the bottom corner. Now, a lot of things that I talk about with people is we do too much analysis, we're too busy, we don't have time to do the stuff that matters. That's probably because you're doing too much stuff down here. And think about this actively. Are you doing stuff down there? If you stop doing a report, would anybody notice that it was gone? Because they're not using it for anything. And they don't believe it even if it does come up with something. Like so first, think of Tom Cruise, show me the money. Second, focus where there's uncertainty and value at risk. And then accept ambiguity. Now this is an old book, it's out of print, which is why it's a really fuzzy cover there. It's the best that we can find. But the title, it's a very small book, if you can get it, read it. Vaguely right or precisely wrong. Accept ambiguity. It's better to be going in the right direction using the right measure, even if it's vague, than to be precise but be wrong. So what he talks about in the book is often people will evaluate advertising based on how much it builds awareness. Because you can measure awareness, you can go do market research surveys. The problem is, is that we know that if you just look at the change in awareness, that won't measure the business impact of advertising. So it's precise, but it's wrong. You're trying to figure out how they change people's mindset about a product. That's harder to measure. But you're better to be trying to measure that and be vaguely right. Now, some of what I'm going to talk about, maybe you'll say a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is common sense. And in one sense it is. In the other sense, people will say that common sense is not common enough. So this sounds obvious, right? Look at where people don't know the answer. Look where the value is. Do your analysis there. But you just don't find that as often as you should in the real world. So my favorite example of that is I was doing work for a real estate company in the Philippines. And we needed to understand consumer demand for a product. I was a consultant to them. They were doing a type of development they hadn't done before. They had always done a certain kind of development. They knew very well how to succeed with that. They used judgment. They didn't do research to figure out if there was demand for the project. But this was a new type of development. And it was very high risk. And the CEO said, I don't know what decision to make. I have to decide whether or not to buy the piece of land, which is going to cost him five or $10 million, and then build on it, cost him another five or $10 million. And after he'd spent 10 to $20 million, he then started selling it. And then he'd find out whether he made a bad decision. So he was a bit nervous about making a $20 million decision. So we needed to do some research to understand if there was demand. And I sent out the research brief to three leading agencies in the Philippines. And two of them got the research brief, and it said, we need results in eight weeks. And they wrote back a proposal. One said 19 weeks. One said 26 weeks. 
because we know what it takes to do research in the Philippines. You are naive about the Philippines. You don't understand how hard it is to do this kind of research in the Philippines. It takes 20 to 26 weeks. The third agency <coughs> calls me up and says, Mike, this research takes 20 to 26 weeks to do in the Philippines. Right? You can't ask for it in eight weeks, but at least she was smart enough to call up and have a dialogue. And I said, Carol, that's great. The CEO has to make a decision in nine weeks. The reason it says eight weeks in the RFP is because information in eight weeks is valuable. Information in 20 weeks is useless. What can you do in eight weeks? So she went back and figured out what they could do in eight weeks. It wasn't as precise as would have gotten out of the other 20 to 26 week approaches. By the way, it wasn't that bad. It was vaguely right, but it helped a CEO make a decision as opposed to being 20 weeks and useless. So when you think about focusing on what decisions you have to make and how do you work in that, don't worry about the statistical significance. I rarely see that change a decision. I'm not saying you shouldn't understand statistical significance and, and the robustness of your data. But think about the business significance of the decision and the timing and focus on that. Third thing, porpoise, or hypothesize. Don't boil the ocean. Anybody here into marine mammals? It's not actually a porpoise, that's a dolphin. Couldn't find a good picture that I liked of a porpoise. But what does porpoising mean? It was something I learned at McKinsey from one of my early managers. Porpoises live above, they breathe, they're mammals but they eat in the water. So what they do is they dive up in the air and they go down in the water. They come up to eat. I said, they come up to breathe and they go down to eat. So they're constantly going like this. That's how a porpoise lives. And that's how you want to approach your analysis. Right? Don't boil the ocean. Don't try and look at everything. Porpoise. So what you do is you sit there and say, let me think about my issues. Let me come up with an answer, a hypothesis. Now dive deep into the data, but focus, because I've got a hypothesis from up here. Dive deep. Come back up, look at it from the top, say, am I proving or disproving my hypothesis? Probably the answer is no. <coughs> dive down deep again. Get into your data. Come back up. So you're going to dive into the data repeatedly. But what you're not going to do is look at everything. What you're doing is diving down in a focused way, coming back up and saying, do I have the answer? If I don't, let me dive down, but I know what I'm looking for. I'm not boiling the ocean. Now, how might that work? And this is, again, a good example of using telco data. Now, this is telco data from the US about 20 years ago, so it's long distance. And back at that time, calling rates went up for long distance at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they went down at 11 p.m. at night. So you can see the pattern here. I don't know how well you can see the yellow line. That's calling patterns of long distance calls during the day across the US. Our task was we were trying to identify certain segments that we understood in the market for market research. And if you just put in the raw data, we had all the raw data, how many calls you made, where you called, all that sort of data. And if you just put in calling patterns, you got nothing. <coughs> But if you said the rates go up at 8 in the morning and they go down at 11, let's see how we might find price sensitive people. Well, if you're price sensitive, you should try and make more calls right before the price changes higher and more calls right after the price goes down. And that's what we found. So we found our price sensitive segment, a group of people making 11% of their calls in that half hour window versus the average of 2%. Now, we didn't get there by boiling the ocean. We got there by saying, what are we looking for? Price-sensitive people. What behavior might we see in price-sensitive people? Right? Altering their calling pattern to save money. We looked for it and found it. And that was one of many variables we used. But it's an example of saying, let me have a specific hypothesis. Let me think about what data might test that hypothesis. And then let me do the analysis. As opposed to just putting everything in there and seeing what comes out. Fourth point, correlation 
is not causal. Everybody learned this in statistics, right? No? You didn't learn this in statistics? Or you're just tired? <laughs> didn't statistics. <laughs> okay, so Dilbert teaches us this, right? Here's the cartoon. So it's when you've got a change, right? It's a matter of which direction is the causality. The other one I like from a friend of mine's blog is reduce global warming become a pirate. Because there's a clear correlation between the number of pirates and global temperatures. So the answer is obvious. If we want to reduce global warming, we need more pirates. Now, you laugh at this, and it is funny in one sense, right? Because I don't think if there are more pirates out there that we'll have um, we'll have a lower global warming. But again, this is common sense. Even if you haven't taken statistics, you ought to know correlation is a causality. But I've seen that people forget that. So there was a team in Korea when I was at McKinsey, and they'd done analysis and they're working for a grocery products company. And they said, we figured out how to grow sales. Okay, so they were thinking about Tom Cruise, right? They had their Jerry Maguire story. We're gonna grow sales. We're gonna grow sales because we're gonna buy shelf space. We're gonna pay the retailer to put more of our product on the shelf more. Because we have proven that when you have more shelf space, you sell more. There's a clear causality there, is what they said. More shelf space is more sales. Well, there's a clear correlation. The more shelf space you have, the more you sell. The causality was the other way around, which is when you sell more, the retailer gives you more shelf space because they don't want to run out of stock. So this is not dumb people. These are my former McKinsey colleagues. But they just weren't thinking about which direction the causality was. And I've seen lots of examples of that. Right, so whether it's using pirates to reduce global warming or thinking about how you drive sales, you have to think about the direction of causality because people forget. Five, close the loop. In fact, that's something that we're talking about with Singtel and SMU, and how we collaborate on closing the loop and using closed loop data analysis. There's a lot of discussion about the value of Google data and web browsing in general. And it has its role, but I'm a bit of a skeptic here, because it doesn't close the loop. Imagine Google data if you were Carter and Yellen. So what Google is saying is, I know what grocery store you went into. I know what aisle you walked at. I know what section you stopped in front of and picked this product off the shelf and looked at. But I don't know if you bought it, and I don't know if you liked it. All I know is what aisles you walked down and what categories you looked at. I don't know whether you bought, and I don't know whether you liked. Now, if Nielsen tried to say, we're not going to sell you sales data, P&G would laugh them out of the room. But that's essentially what Google is. Now, as we're advancing in analytics, it's better than having nothing. And I'll actually come to that topic in a minute. But I sort of like Amazon better, because Amazon closes the loop. So Amazon knows what you browse, but they also know what you buy. And if you do a review, they know what you like. And if you want to try an interesting experiment, go in with your cookie turned off so they don't know any of your history, and pick a book. And then see what other books get recommended. Then go buy the book. You will see the recommendations change. Because they understand that browsing is different from purchasing. Then go in and write a review on the book. And the recommendations change again. Because they know that the review <coughs> tells more about you as a person, and you're closing the loop. So in this example, where we've got Harry Potter books. If you actually wrote, wrote a review of the first one and said, I hated this book, it's very childlike, why does anybody care about wizards? They're not going to recommend that you read the second book in the series, because they know you didn't like the first book, even though you bought it. So it's thinking about closing the loop. And again, this is one where it sounds obvious, but there's a lot of discussions of people saying, well, I can't close the loop, so I'll do what I can. And I understand that, but it's also saying, how do you close the loop? 
Sixth point. In trying to understand people's needs, there's an awful lot of demographic profiling out there. Now, if you ask me, is demographics useful? The answer is it's better than nothing. So if you're going to do nothing in terms of profiling or targeting, okay, use demographics. But demographics are actually not very predictive of needs. Most of you in this room are in the same demographic group. And yet, if I went around the room, and I won't because there's too many people here, but if it was a smaller group, I'd say, what did you wash your hair with this morning? And you'd get dozens, if not multiple dozens, of answers. Because the fact that you're all about the same age, about the same socioeconomic class, about the same education, a lot of demographics are the same, doesn't tell me what you're going to use to wash your hair. It also doesn't tell me a lot about what financial service products you're going to use and what telecom products you're going to use, but it's better than nothing. So there are some things that are used more by older people than younger people, some things that are used more by men than women. But you're better off trying to find attitudes. What do people think? What are their needs? Because that's going to be more predictive of what you actually might want. And even better to look at behavior. And in the future world, you'll be able to combine all three. And that's a lot of what I try and do in my work. Saying we have demographics, we have attitudes, we have behaviors. And if you have all of them, you're better off. But when you have all of them, you actually find the demographics are icing on the cake. They don't actually tell you a lot. And yet, you'd be surprised at how much people rely on them. And they look at demographic skews. Seven. I've had a lot of conversations over the years saying I've got some interesting segments in the market. Hopefully needs-based segments, not demographic. How do I find them? Because the problem with needs-based or behavioral segments is you don't know them when they walk in the door. So if you do a segmentation for a bank, they'll sit there and say, if you give me a demographic segmentation that says old versus young, or even rich versus poor, I can sort of figure out when they walk in the door what segment they're. The problem is if you tell, tell me someone's a service seeker versus someone's a do-it-yourselfer, I can't tell when they walk in the door what segment they're in. So I'd rather use the demographics because it's more actionable. It's actionable, but it's also not very precise. Again, better than doing nothing. So how do you get around that? Well, there's only three ways. I wish there were more, but there's only three. The first is you do what American Express and a lot of other people do. You put out there different options for different segments, and you let people choose. So you don't do any targeting. You let the customer find their one. But that means you can't put a lot of options out there, because you can't confuse people. Because if you put more options out there, people get confused. So you can have, and maybe this is even too many cards. But you can put different options out there and let people choose. Second, use your sales force. Use your channel partners. Give them questions that identify what segment someone's in, and then allow your channel partner or your sales force to deliver a message. So this is a series of three questions that a sales force was given, and it was based on the answers. And you can see it's a very simple decision tree. Then they can decide what offer to make. And some of the stuff can be very practical. So not in this example, but in another one, we're trying to figure out who was a price-sensitive buyer and who was a service-sensitive buyer. This is for wholesale telecoms, not Singtel. And the sales reps, by the way, will overwhelmingly tell you their customers are price-sensitive. Because if you're a sales rep, it's always easy to say, I didn't make the sale because our price was too high. And by the way, that's true sometimes, because there always is going to be a price-sensitive segment. But it's usually a lot smaller than the sales force believes it is. And by the way, if you can sell to the service sensitive people or whatever the non-price sensitive segments are, you capture some of that surplus, going back to Jerry Maguire. Because people who are less price sensitive, if you can deliver them what they want, they'll pay you a surplus. So in that case, we couldn't ask the buyer, excuse me, are you price sensitive or are you service sensitive? You know, would you like it if I charged you more for service? <laughs> exactly. But what you could do is ask them, 
Do you report to the CFO or the CIO? And our research showed which one was price sensitive? The one reporting to the CFO or the CIO? Right. <laughs> CFOs are cheap. Right? And if it reported to the CFO, it was, I don't care if I'm spending another penny a minute on telecom. I need redundancy because if the network goes out, everybody's on my back. So that's a simplified example of what your sales force, then you can say, by the way, if they report to the CIO, sell them the server sensitive package. Now that, that it was more sophisticated than that, but it gives you a sense of where you can go with the sales force. And the third is data mining. And that's more and more what you're gonna see in the future, is data mining. And that's using all the data you have to predict what segment, and now you're talking not five segments or six segments like in American Express. You're not talking about the four or five that you can use your channel partners. Now you can be talking about hundreds or maybe even thousands of segments. So this is an example from a best practice player in the US, Capital One. In Capital One, when you call in, they don't sit there and say, by the way, here's our automated call center and press one for this and two for that and three for that. They keep the data. They predict why you're calling. They'll tell you that 70% of the time they get it right. And they route the call to that department. So they use the data to deliver superior customer service. And by the way, the 30% of the time when they get it wrong, they just reroute the call differently. And the rest of this example, which I won't go through, is how they then use the information to tailor what they offer you, how they offer it, etc. So it's data mining to find seconds. By the way, you get a very different perspective of the value of data when you're doing this. So I went to Capital One a few years ago with clients from Korea. And they said, well, tell us how much of your data you keep. And they said, we keep all of it. And they said, well, you must not have understood our question. You can't keep all of it. You must summarize or whatever. You, know, you can't keep all the raw data. It'd be too much data. They said, no, we understood your question. We keep all of it. They said, well, how long do you keep it for? I said, forever. And they said, uh, you must not have understood our question. <laughs> right? You can't keep all of your data forever. That would be too much data. And they said, no, we understood your question perfectly well. We keep all of our data forever. They then said that they had a database that was second only to the US government. <laughs> because they said data is an asset, it's not a cost. We use the data, we make predictions about why you're calling, what price to charge you, they have tens of thousands of seconds. So if you've got a segmentation, whether it's four or five segments, you can predict with methods one or two, or hundreds, you can use these three methods. Unfortunately, there's not a fourth or fifth. Which leads to how do you use these segments, or more importantly, how do you use the data? And this is learn and do, learn and do. Speed matters more than precision. So what you see here on the left, this is the CRM test and learn cycle. And there's lots of different cycles, closed loop again, that you'll come across in your business dealings. And what Capital One and others have realized is it's not about perfection at each stage. It's not about going through and getting it precisely right. It's actually vaguely right. Because what you find is by going around faster and faster and faster and doing more iterations, you actually get more learning than if you stop and try and perfect each step. And that's what you see on the left here. This is Capital One's experience in how many tests they were doing. This is back when they were starting in the mid-90s. And they realized that 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 tests, now they do 30 to 40,000 tests a year. Or at least that's the published number, it's a couple years old, they're probably doing more. What they realize is it's not about the precision, right? it's about the speed. Now that doesn't mean you should be imprecise or sloppy, but it's a difference of saying, let me keep iterating, because if I get it vaguely right, I can do another iteration, get it vaguely righter, and then I can get it vaguely righter and I'm going to learn more from doing that than I am from stopping and trying to be precise at each stage. Nine. <coughs> Think about the outputs. It amazes me 
how much people think about inputs and try and sell on inputs and not outputs. And up until recently, I was on the other side, and whether you're at McKinsey or Cinebay, you're a supplier, you're selling people and using your services. And people still want to say, you know, we can do this great, we can do that great. They wouldn't think about the outputs. And that's what Ted Levin says, is people don't want a quarter-inch drill. They're buying a quarter-inch hole. And if you want to sell effectively, or you want your analysis to be effective, think about the hole, don't think about the drill. Because the reality is, People don't want the drill. So I used to sit there and say, in market research, no one wakes up in the morning saying, I want market research. They do, they're kind of sick. Right? <laughs> they wake up saying, I have an information need. There's something I don't know that I need to make a decision. And they actually don't care whether you use a drill or a shovel. Right? They don't care about the tool. They care about the output. <clears throat> Last thing. And this came as one of the most surprising things to me as I left McKinsey and joined Cinebate about seven or eight years ago. And when I left McKinsey, I expected that in going to Cinebate, I'd spend a lot of time helping people do more sophisticated analysis. And in fact, I did do a lot. But I didn't do as much of it as I thought. What I learned is that people often had pretty good holes. They had an answer but they were covering it up so badly that the client didn't understand the answer. So you can do the best analysis in the world, but if you can't clearly communicate the answer, the client's gonna think you're an idiot because they don't understand the answer. And they don't wanna to have to do the work to figure out the answer. That's what they're paying you for, or hopefully what they're paying you for. So when you do your analysis, clearly communicate. What does that mean? A 30 second elevator speech, and I'll be finding to these in a minute, a one-page summary, a short document, and throw all the rest of the stuff in the appendix. So what's an elevator speech? In this building, it's in trouble. If you're an elevator, it's only, what, five floors, six floors? <laughs> an elevator speech is you walk into the elevator, and the dean walks in and says, what are you learning? Right? And you have five floors to say something insightful. And you don't really want to say I'm learning good stuff. <laughs> right, you want to give a clear message. And so what you're taught at McKinsey the first day is if the CEO walks into the elevator with you and says, how's the project going? You don't go, it's going fine. We're learning lots of stuff. People are real cooperative. By the way, how about that football game last week? <laughs> That's not what you do if you're at McKinsey. You start off by saying, here's our hypothesis and here's our answer, and you do it in 30 seconds. It's an elevator, and you only have 30 seconds. And one of the best examples of that, not from McKinsey, is I was teaching that within Cinema, and someone had a good example. And they had done a new product test, and the client walked into the room and said, I know we've got an hour and a half book to go through this review, and I'm really interested in the results. This is my most important product launch this quarter, so I really need to know. But unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting. So I don't have time to go through your report. And he walked up to the chief researcher and he said, so tell me, should I launch? This person was a bold researcher. Most would, most would sit there and try and ask about the web. And the person said, launch. And the client said, that's what I want to know, walked out of the room. One word elevator speech. Now the client walked back in 10 minutes later he said, I actually do want to hear about the rest of the detail. But I wanted to make sure that you were on the same plane that I am. I have a decision to make. Right? Sound familiar from my earlier points? I want to make sure you're helping me make that decision. And that decision is not how many pages can you throw at me of data? What fancy analysis can you do? It's should I launch this product or not? That was his elevator speech. <coughs> now, to do an elevator speech, what you want to think about is synthesis, not summaries. What do I mean by that? So here's three facts. Right? Broke my knee, broke the knock from the car window, I got a speeding ticket. The summary is rewording. Right? My knee, car, and wallet were all damaged. Right? What's a synthesis? I've been where I shouldn't be. Right? It's not repeating the facts, it's figuring out what it means. And it's amazing how many times people mistake one for the other. 
So my favorite story on synthesis, it's out of a book called Make It Stick, great book on communication. And there's a story that Nora Ephron told. And she was in a class, a journalism class, and they were being taught how to write headlines. And the professor says, okay, write the headline, here's the story, you're writing the headline for a student newspaper, the principal is going to the state capitol to accept an award on behalf of the school for excellent teaching. And because it's for excellent teaching, the teachers are going with the principal to the state capitol to receive the award. Now write the headline. And the headlines were principal receiving award, principal to receive award, teachers going with principal to state capitol. Is that synthesis or is that summary? And summary. Anybody know what the synthesis is? Right, what someone just said it, what? Right. Your audience reading a school paper, the students. The headline was, no school tomorrow. The teachers and the principal are going to the state capitol. <laughs> right? That's what it means. And that's where you have to take your elevator speech and then your executive summary and make it say something important. So when you do your executive summary, which is one page, it really angers me when I sit there and people give me 75 page documents and they don't have an executive summary anywhere. And it's like, tell me what it is you found out that's important to me. Right? So you have one page, you start with your elevator speech, which is your answer, and then you can give two to five reasons, but it's on one page. I have done presentations where we've done a 15 or 20 page report, but we've written a really good one page summary, and we've never left the one page. Because when you do really good analysis, what you'll find is the client trusts the analysis says what you concluded it did. What they want to talk about is the implications. So they'll read through the executive summary. They may sit there and say, that doesn't seem right to me, let's talk about that. Or they may sit there and say, that's fine. Now let's get on to what it means, what we should do. And maybe they'll go back and read the report later, or maybe they'll never read it because you got to the point. So what does a concise report look like? You start with your executive summary, one page of background. Don't give me 20 pages of background. I put it in the appendix. Give me my first point, give me three charts. My second point, three charts. Third point, three charts. By the way, that's enough. There's going to be very few things that you can't summarize in three major points with three charts. Now maybe there's four charts for one point, two for another. And maybe the professors here, whether the professors, maybe they want 25 pages per point. I don't know, to get uh, graded on the number of pages. But as a business user or a supplier of business analytics, that's not what my clients want. It's not what often people think the clients want. But if you talk to a senior client, They'll say, I want the executive summary and I want that. And I don't want any more than that. Right? Put the rest of the appendix. Now what you find is, there's something that's totally irrelevant to your point. But you just have to tell the client. So okay, put in another section which says other findings. Which is code for you really don't need to read this section. Put it in there. And then have your next step, and then have hundreds of pages of appendix. I will guarantee you if you do a report like this, that you have a much happier client than if you do the typical report. So, you know, the first nine points are how do you do good analysis? This last one is how do you make sure that people can understand the results of the analysis that you've done? By the way, I see a bunch of people taking pictures. I'm happy to send out copies of this. By the way, I didn't invent this. McKinsey didn't invent this. A lady named Barbara Minto, a book called The Pyramid Principle. This is how you write that kind of report. So, what do I think I learned that I wish I'd known up front? First, be modest, because you're probably wrong. Think about business significance, purpose, dive down deep but know what you're looking for. Don't mistake correlation for causality. Close the loop, figure out whether someone likes something, whether they bought it. Don't stop at just whether they're interested. Where you can get behaviors and attitudes. There's three ways to identify segments and not more. Learn and do, look for speed, focus on outputs, <coughs> communicate clearly. And if you do that, hopefully you'll have more success in your analysis than I had when I started out. Thank you very much.
the other side. <coughs> Any question from the floor? Everybody's hungry and wants to go eat dinner. <laughs> It can't have made that much sense. Hi, my, my name is Mamit. Uh, I work for HP. Uh, I would like to ask about the closing the loop thing. Because, yeah, uh, Google is doing the analytics thing, but what can you, why are they not stopping? You know, you said that, why do you need the app? Why do you need not close the loop when you can, right? Well, Google understands the gap. So if you look at Google Plus and other things they're doing, they're trying to say, how can I capture more data? They, I mean, they've been a very good business in selling the advertising they do. But they realize that they have to keep going further. And they don't have the ability to understand what books you like at Amazon does. So they're doing that. By the way, they put lots of stuff on the Android phone, which is also their product they're trying to understand more of what they do. So it's not that there's no value in what they do. It's just that if you can go to the next step, you can get far more insight into customer behaviors and predict what it is they'll buy or alter what they're going to buy by giving them information on the centers. Better than nothing. Better than what? Nothing. Better than nothing. Um, and look, Google Analytics is very good. You'll find out lots of good stuff. But it's more of when you look at other analysis you do if you stop at halfway through the purchase process and you don't say, how do I capture the data? Now, by the way, the problem with going further is the vaguely read and precisely wrong. I may not know exactly what someone bought. Right? I may have to estimate it, or I may only have information on some people. But when you use the data as a push it, you accept the ambiguity, but you look at what people bought or what people liked. Because not everybody on Amazon does a review, so Amazon doesn't know what everybody likes. They have to estimate what some people like. Right? They don't know what everybody bought, because you may have gone on Amazon and then you went to Barnes & Noble and bought a book, or you know, whatever it's called here. Um, you know, so they don't have the full information, but they'll do the best they can with that information. But the point is, even if you don't have it, think about how you might get the earth. And you know, if you're at HP, you have to deal through retailers. Retailers don't necessarily want to tell you what the end of the loop is. And they may have an incentive to withhold information from customers. Because they may believe that they own the customer, and if they tell you who the customer is, that you'll try and sell directly to the customer, and therefore they're going to hide the customer. And so they've got, and they've got reason to do that. But then how do you close the loop by understanding who the customer is? And you actually know some cases, because you get warranty cards or registrations and other ways of closing the loop. And maybe you have the information on the warranty card that tells you what the retailer was. It won't be perfect, but it'll be better than simply saying we know what we sold into the retailer as opposed to who they sold it to and how what price they sold at. Hey, Eric. Hi. Um, I'm June, a business user of consumer analytics. Um, and just like Good. We need more of those. <laughs> Yeah, I'd just like to focus on the point for business significance, which is green and it's that significance. Um, in the past five years, I've seen HBR blogs and reports, and a lot of people going into qualitative methodologies as a tool. But of course, we do want to focus on the outputs. Now, one of the challenges that I'm hearing from business leaders are, uh, well, it's not statistically significant. So, so how do you? strike that balance between the quant and the core that maybe you'd like to share from your experience. Ooh, I think we could spend about three hours on that. <laughs> um, but it's a very good point. A couple things to think about. One is different analyses have different purposes or different values. And understand how to use different analyses as opposed to trying to make one size fits all. So qualitative research is absolutely critical. It does not, in most cases, give you an answer. What it does do is tell you what the potential answers are. So what, when you do a quantitative survey, what people are not going to do is say, well, stop. Stop asking me these quantitative questions. You're asking me the wrong question. What you really need to know is this. Right? That doesn't happen in quant. 
That does happen in qual. So when you do qual, you sit there and say, I'm doing two things. One, I'm understanding the potential answers or the potential issues. You're never going to get that out of qual. And there's different forms of qual that you can do. But qual is great for understanding the potential answers. The other thing qual is good for is figuring out how to word a question. Because often, how you ask something will influence the answer. And in fact, there's an example of that in Singapore, I guess it was, I think, probably 1999, 2000. I came to the region in 97. And we're doing work looking at prepaid cards, prepaid phone cards. And they've been launched in the market and they were doing very poorly. And the company was trying to figure out why they were prepaid cards were doing very poorly. And they did a focus group. And they were explaining the prepaid cards and the benefits. And someone stopped and said, do you mean a stored value card? And the person said, well, yeah, that's what a prepaid card is. Well, everybody in the focus group said, oh, that's what you're talking about. Because MRT had stored value cards. Everybody knew what a stored value card was. No one had heard about a prepaid card. And just by understanding how to term something, they were then able to understand how to communicate. Now, the problem is if you sit there and say, well, I'm going to take a focus group of 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 people and try and figure out what the answer is. And by the way, I've seen people say, well, it's not statistically significant, so I'm going to do 150 focus groups. I had one client in 150 focus groups. And 150 non-projectable focus groups is the same thing as one non-projectable focus group. You understand issues, you don't get answers. Now there are ways of trying to quantify some qualitative output. So what you see a lot of now is looking at the text that comes out of qualitative and trying to do different forms of neuro-linguistic programming and other analysis that says I can actually look at hundreds or thousands of people's verbatims or other uh, way of talking, and then try and quantify it. So you need qualitative. It has its role. It doesn't give you the answer generally. That's what you want quantitative for, particularly if you're worried about projectability. But if you don't do the qual, there's a good chance you'll do the quant wrong. So it's really not trying to use one instead of the other, but to use them together so you get a better answer. I hope that's helpful. Any other questions? You're a very shy group. I'll stick around later, and if there's something you don't want to ask in front of the whole group, you realize that the question you're wondering about, there are five other people wondering about too. They're just not as brave to go and ask the question. Anyway, I'll stick around afterwards.